Welcome to Snooze with Sam. Scottish ambient sleep stories, meditations, and reading the back of fast food labels. Now just before this story begins, I would like to take a moment to thank my patrons once again. Now last week I said a very special thank you to everyone who had joined recently, but it was potentially ill timing because (laughs) what I would love to say this week is thank you to those patrons who have been with me for over a year now. Now there are a small handful of you and there will be more to come, but for those who have been a patron for over a year, I would like to thank Carol Lawson, Patty Gill, Deborah, Tracy Lyman, Candy Hill and Christine Young. Thank you and please check your emails for something in your inbox. This week we have another dose of Scottish history for you in the shape of the Jacobites. A very interesting time and a very interesting organisation, you could say, as the name Jacobites comes from the Latin for James, as they were avid supporters of King James at the time. However, as you will learn, their endeavours and political stature were not greatly received, and their image, reputation and depictions through history are a real mixed bag. Very famous for their involvement in the Battle of Culloden, as well as associations with Bonnie Prince Charlie. Let's learn the truth about the Jacobites. Who were they? How did they threaten the power structure of Britain during the 17th and 18th centuries? We will answer these questions and more in this story. So, as always, when you are quite ready, lie back. Take a nice deep breath and enjoy this story. This story is called Jacobites, the fascinating truth. To find out the story of the Jacobites in Scotland, we need to go back to 1685, when King Charles II died. He was succeeded by James II, also known as James VII in Scotland, a Catholic. As there was a great deal of anti-Catholic resentment at the time, Protestants were very wary of their new king. Their fears grew when James's Protestant daughter, Mary, married William of Orange and was no longer in the line of succession. The final straw 
was when King James II had a son, James Francis Edward Stuart, and there became a Catholic succession line. The opponents of King James II invited William III of Orange to invade England in 1688. The following year, William and Mary became joint monarchs in what became known as the Glorious Revolution and James II fled to the continent. So, supporters of the exiled King James II became known as Jacobites because Jacobus or Jacobus was the Latin word for James. Support for King James II was particularly strong in Scotland and the Jacobites' plan was to restore him to his rightful throne. As far as they were concerned, anyway. The Jacobite Rebellion The first of five Jacobite rebellions and uprisings took place in 1689 when Viscount Dundee held Edinburgh Castle with a garrison of around a hundred supporters. Later in the year, the Jacobite army met the government forces at the Battle of Killycrankey in Perthshire. The Jacobites were victorious, but Viscount Dundee was killed in the fighting, and the rising fizzled out as a result. The Pass of Killycrankey is the site of Soldier's Leap, where one of the government redcoat soldiers jumped an astounding 18 feet across the River Garry to make his escape from his Jacobite pursuers. The Jacobite Rebellion of 1715 In the year 1701, King James II, or the Seventh, died in exile. France recognised his son that was James Francis Edward Stuart, if you don't remember. They recognised him as the rightful King of Scotland. 6 years later, in 1707, the Act of Union was enacted, which combined the kingdoms of Scotland and England. This was a very controversial event in Scotland, and there was much opposition within the country. This seems to be the theme with every Scottish history story I ever make, because it's still the same today. <laughs> what has changed, I ask you? A very little is the answer. 
but I am perfectly neutral, always. Great view on the fence, as I always say. Hostility towards the monarchy grew after Queen Anne died in 1714. She had no heir, so George, a ruler of Hanover in Germany, was chosen to succeed her. King George I was crowned over King James Francis Edward Stuart, who many considered the rightful monarch. In September 1715, the Earl of Mar declared support for the Jacobite cause at a rally in Braemar. There was widespread sympathy for the cause in Scotland. The primary battle of the campaign took place at Sheriff Muir in November 1715, where the Jacobites met the government army led by the Duke of Argyll. The result was inconclusive but considered a defeat for the Jacobites. James Francis Edward Stuart arrived from France later in the year to rally his supporters, but to no avail. Imagine making that trip to start your own party, but nobody turned up. I bet he was gutted. Disheartened, he returned to France in February 1716, and the Jacobites disbanded. The Battle of Glensheel, the Jacobite Rising in 1719. Perhaps the least well-known Jacobite rebellion took place in 1719 and involved the Spanish army of King Philip V of Spain. An armada of ships sailed from Cadiz to land some 5,000 troops in the west of England, where it was thought there was much opposition to King George. A much smaller expedition of two frigates and three hundred soldiers set sail for Scotland. The main task force encountered a ferocious storm that scattered the fleet, and the English invasion was called off. The ships sailing for Scotland also encountered stormy weather, but continued their journey. Much delayed, the Spanish ships made landfall near Ellen Donnan Castle on Loch Duich near the Isle of Skye. They took the castle and used it 
as a store for their ammunition. News of the impending attack had reached the British government and British warships were dispatched to intercept the invaders. When the British fleet arrived on the scene, the castle was stormed and the Spanish guards taken prisoner. The castle was blown up in a colossal explosion, which left not much more than a stump in its place. The Jacobite clans had joined the Spanish troops, creating a force around a thousand strong. They met the government forces in Glenshiel, and both sides fought with determination, but eventually the government side prevailed. Amongst those that fought for the Jacobite side was the famous folk hero Rob Roy MacGregor. The Spanish troops were taken as prisoners of war and marched to Edinburgh. Eventually, they were sent back to Spain and the 1719 Jacobite Rising was over. Who was Bonnie Prince Charlie? Charles Edward Stuart was the son of James Francis Edward Stuart and the grandson of King James II. He was born in Rome on the 3rd of December 1720. His childhood was one of great privilege, being brought up in a palace gifted by Pope Clement XI. Considered the legitimate heir to the English, Scottish and Irish thrones, he was surrounded by courtiers and advisers. A nickname given to Charles Edward Stuart was the Young Pretender, and his father was referred to as the Old Pretender. It's perhaps no surprise then that his destiny was to attempt a recapture of the crown on behalf of his father, grandfather and the Stuart dynasty. The Jacobite rising 1745. Prince Charles Edward Stuart first stepped foot on Scottish soil on the 23rd of July 1745, when he landed on the Hebridean island of Eriskay. 
a month later, he raised his standard at Glenfinnan, and the Jacobite Rising of 1745 had begun. For those of you who hope to visit Scotland or have visited in the past, Glenfinnan is a place of great significance because there you will find a statue of himself, Bonnie Prince Charlie. And not only is it famous for his presence, but the railway viaduct very close by was used and is very famous for the Harry Potter films. It is the bridge that you can see the Hogwarts Express crossing. Ironically, the Jacobite army used the roads built in the highlands to quell earlier uprisings to quickly move south. In September, they took Edinburgh and won a victory against the government forces at the Battle of Preston Pans. Bonnie Prince Charlie held court at Holyrood Palace before continuing southwards into England. The Jacobites reached Derby on the 4th of December 1745, just 150 miles from London. Bonnie Prince Charlie's advisers were concerned about a lack of support in England and proposed a retreat back to Scotland to wait for French assistance. Reluctantly, the Prince agreed. The famous Battle of Culloden. The Battle of Culloden of 1746, where British troops defeated the Scottish Jacobite army for the final time near Inverness, has long been misrepresented for political purposes. The Jacobites struggle to restore the deposed Stuart dynasty to the British throne was a major threat to the success of a single centralised Britain. Yet, for several centuries, historians presented the Jacobites as merely kilted primitives. Culloden also saw the beginning of a national narrative about reconciling England and its less developed peripheries. A mission that would soon also be applied to more remote people to justify expanding the British Empire. Benjamin West's very famous painting of the death of General Wolfe, which depicted not Culloden but the Battle of Quebec of 1759 between Britain and France, is an early example 
of how this was done. It pictures a curious Native American observing the British General's dignified death. Behind the man in green uniform stands Simon Fraser, chief of the clan Fraser, who had fought for the Jacobites on the opposite side to Wolf at Culloden. The message shown is plain. Fraser had been integrated into the dignity of the British Imperium, as the Native American will be too. It is no coincidence that this idea of Jacobite primitives has been contested since 1970, as Imperial Britain has become more fragmented and, as I always say, Scottish nationalism has risen again. Yet the popular image of the Jacobites at Culloden remains. Arguably no battle is remembered so powerfully, yet so falsely. A film created in the 60s called Culloden, created by Peter Watkins, demonstrates this continued enduring power of this vision, in which modern British guns supposedly brought down kilted swordsmen. British statists and romantic Scottish patriots have both drawn on the same image. Dirty, baldy armed savages sacrificing themselves for the Italian princeling, Bonnie Prince Charlie or Prince Charles, yet get credit for nobly defending an ancient way of life. Culloden, as it happened, is in fact much more interesting than Culloden as it's remembered. What really happened? On Culloden Moor, on April the 16th, which is my birthday, by the way, 1746. Arguably the last Scottish army sought to restore Prince Charles's father James to a multi-kingdom monarchy more aligned to European politics than colonial struggles. Forget any idea of Highland clans against British regiments. The Jacobites were heavily armed with muskets and formed into conventional regiments. They were drilled according to French conventions and some British army practice, and fought next to Franco-Irish and Scoto-French allies. They also possessed numerous artillery pieces, and fired more balls per man than the British. On the other hand, they had no more than 200 mounted men. 
and the British had almost four times as many. Once the Jacobite front line failed to break the British front at more than one point, their reinforcements were readily disrupted by British cavalry and dragoons on the wings, and the ensuing disorder led to collapse. The British benefited from using their cavalry late on, having learned from the battles of Preston Pans and Falkirk. The Jacobite army also only numbered around 5,000 in total barely a third of its maximum strength in the rising of 1745 to 46, and several thousand fewer than the British. This army fought in Culloden in spite of these numbers, partly because it was a regular army and unsuited to a guerrilla campaign. Culloden was always going to be difficult for the Jacobites to win. But this manpower shortage, combined with the lack of cavalry, was critical. That was what made it possible for the British Dragoon Blades to cut down the Jacobite Musketeers. The Jacobites are also usually accused of choosing the wrong battlefield. The Irish Quartermaster and Jacobite Adjutant General John Sullivan gets blamed for persuading Prince Charles to choose boggy, flat terrain, which did not play to the army's strengths. Some historians argue that the error was not listening to an alternative suggestion by the Prince's Lieutenant General, Lord George Murray. While it is true that Sullivan vetoed several other sites, one of which was at least Murray's choice, neither made sense. The best site was chosen by Sullivan one kilometre east of the final battle line. Its only disadvantage was that it was very visible to the Royal Navy in the Morifar. This delayed the Jacobites night attack on April 15th and in the subsequent confusion they ended up deployed further west than intended. So in that sense no one chose the final battlefield. Civil War or Conquest? Right up until the 1960s, Culloden was seen 
as the final battle in an Anglo-Scottish conflict. It was the precursor to the Highlands becoming the last part of Scotland to be fully incorporated into Great Britain, the British Empire, and, most importantly, the British Army. This helped underline the sense of Jacobites as aliens, Gaelic-speaking Catholics in an English-speaking Protestant country. Never mind that all Jacobite military orders were in English. <laughs> but the rise of modern Scottish nationalism made the idea of an Anglo-Scottish battle uncomfortable. Jacobitism has nationalist implications these days. And since the 60s, there has been a determined effort by British historians to present Culloden as the final battle in a civil war. Culloden was, of course, a civil war, as was the Anglo-Irish War of 1919-1921, or just as that with the American War of Independence. But every national struggle divides its nation. And the Jacobite rising of 1745 to 1746 was certainly a fight for a Scottish nation too. Ending the Anglo-Scottish Union of 1707 to restore the Stuarts' multi-kingdom monarchy was a key Jacobite war aim. So not only is the primitives narrative wrong, and not only was the battle quite different to the memory, but Culloden was the final significant defeat of a Scottish alternative to the British state. The irony is that a federal British Isles under a single crown, which had existed between 1603 and 1707, is effectively what the Jacobites wanted. And we, as a nation, are closer to that now than the victors of Culloden could have ever imagined.